Hi guys, it's Lapsworn now. How's everyone doing? Good, good, good. I hope I did this video mm, about three years ago, um, almost three years ago, and I thought I would do it again. I thought I would revitalise it, revamp it, because in the space of three years, I have gained a lot more subscribers. And I'm doing this video because I am trying to be helpful to people that might be fragrance newbies or people that are kind of just starting their journey. I know that when I started my journey, a lot of these words were banded around by reviewers, whether it's written down or YouTube reviewers. And to be quite frank, a lot of them I didn't really know what they were and I probably misused them a whole bunch of times. So I'm doing this as a helpful thing. It is making sense of perfume language. A to Z. There's no Z's in here, but it's in alphabetical order. So, yeah. So without further ado, I'm going to attempt to maybe clear up a few things that might make you say, huh? Come again? Say what now? So the first one on the list is Accord. Accord. Perfume language is not too dissimilar to the language of music. You have accords, you have notes, you have things that are harmonious, you have tones. And what a chord means in a perfume, in the perfume world, is a bunch of notes or a bunch of nuances put together to create the feeling of something else. Kind of like mixing blue and yellow together to get green, let's say. A really good example of an accord would be uh, leather. So perfumers do not distill leather jackets. There isn't a vat of leather jackets with steam going through it to create leather. Leather. It's normally an accord made up of things like birch tar, tobacco, sometimes patchouli, and perfumers use accords to create things that aren't necessarily easy to get f directly from nature. So you find it with a lot of flowers, things like peony, a peony in a fragrance is always going to be an accord. It's going to be a number of other things together to create a feeling of something else. It's like an illusion, basically, and it's a really cool one. You'll see that word in so many fragrance descriptions where it will say something or other accord. So usually it's something fantasy or something that you can't create. So that's what that is. The next one is aromatic. Aromatic in the perfume world refers to a style of fragrance or a note that is herbaceous. It can be anything that is a herb. So rosemary, thyme, you don't need me to tell you what herbs are, I'm sure you know what they are, but if a fragrance is described as aromatic, it just means herbs. It's not too fancy, quite simple. Base notes. So you will have heard this one probably a lot. It might be a quite an obvious one, but I'm putting it in there because I understand that not everybody knows what everything means that us, me in particular, talks about all the time. Base notes are the, think of a fragrance like a house, okay? You need foundations, you need a base, you need something that holds everything up. It's like a structure, basically. And base notes are usually made up, this is typically, obviously rules get bended all the time nowadays, but base notes are usually made up of things like woods, because they last the longest, um, resins and sometimes spices but everything's interchangeable this is very loose what I'm saying right now but base notes are the notes they are the background of the perfume that you smell when when everything is said and done and the perfume is made base notes are the things that you will smell last they are the last things to burn off of your skin and base notes are normally 50% of an entire makeup of a fragrance so that's what that is. It's the base. It's the grounding part of a fragrance. It's the background. The next one is my worst and most annoying word to say in the French language, but I'm going to attempt it for you guys. It's chypre. Chypre. If you're like me and you're from London, you say chypre. So chypre is a style of fragrance. Um, it. A lot of people think that it was first, the first ever Chypre was from 1917. It was Francois Coty. Coty is a real big f um, fragrance brand and they have a fragrance called Chypre. It's a style of fragrance and it translates to Cyprus in French. Chypres are traditionally aimed at women and it's kind of like a recipe. A Chypre has to contain a citrusy opening, labdanum resin in the heart, and then a mossy base. Some really good examples of Chypres are Chanel No. 19, and Mitsuko by Guerlain, and also Aromatics Elixir by... 
Clinique. <laughs> I got there eventually. So a lot of people think that the Shepra was first invented in 1917, but apparently it was more than a century before. So you have lots of different styles of Shepras now, but it's always citrusy opening, labdanum, and then oak moss. Perfumers now twist and variate that quite a lot, but that's a style. It's just, it's not my favourite style of fragrance at all, but I really do appreciate them. You get fruity Shepras now, you get floral Shepras, but usually they're kind of much more on the woody side. So that's what a Shepra is. Dry down. A lot of people use this term and it's another one that might seem obvious, but when you're talking about the development of a fragrance, you have the opening, you have the heart, and then you have the dry down. The dry down refers to base notes mainly. It's what you get far into the wear length of wearing your fragrance. It's what comes after everything else. At the end of the day of work, say you sprayed a fragrance in the morning, when you get home from work, what you're smelling is the dry down. It's the driest stage of wearing your perfume, and it's normally gonna be something woody, or something resinous, or something, I don't know, but it's C base notes, go back. <laughs> Flanker. This word I don't like, it's, it, it makes sense, but I don't like what a flanker is. When perfume reviewers or perfume people or perfumistas refer to something as a flanker, what it means is it's a secondary, tertiary, fourth, fifth, sixth version of a fragrance that's already on the market. Take for instance, let me think of some companies that are really well known for doing f multiple flankers. So, Jean-Paul Gaultier. He released Le Mal in 1990 something. How many more versions of Le Mal have you seen on the market? DKMY is another one, massive one for flankers. Those Be Delicious Apple bottles, there's been, I think, 30 more variations of that. So all it means is a variation of an already established perfume from a company. That's it. A lot of people don't like flankers. Me personally, I'm one of those people. I, I, it's very rare that I think that a flanker is better than the original. I always stick to original things. There's been a few exceptions, but that's what a flanker is. If you flank someone, you're walking behind them. Your flanks on your body, it's your behind. Fougère. Fougère to me is the masculine equivalent of a Shepra. So it's a style of fragrance and it was started by Paul Raquet, I think his name is, Paul Parquet, um, in 1882. Fougère translates as fern. It doesn't mean that there is fern in the fragrance. It's called Fougère because the emblem of his company was a fern. Not a lot of people know that, but it's true. Or so I'm told. So a Fougère is the masculine version of a Chypre. It normally contains a citrusy opening um, and then a herbaceous heart, usually lavender. Uh, that's the classic kind of um, formula of, of a fougère. And then you ha usually have oak moss again in the base. But fougère is more like a feeling. You can create a fougère type feeling without having oak moss and lavender. Things can get switched. They can use patchouli, they can use different things. And But it usually refers to something aromatic. See, aromatic, go back. You might need to rewind a few times in this video. Fougères aren't my favourite style either, but I appreciate them because it was, you know, a groundbreaking thing that was discovered in perfumery. So, Paul Parquet it was the owner of Ubigon, Ubigant, or Haubigant, however you want to say it. He is the person that discovered Fougère or invented Fougère. Some great examples of it are Kouros by YSL, and uh, what's the other one I was going to say? The DNG Pour on the one that used to come in the blue bottle, still does, and also Eternity for men. It's an aromatic, mossy, kind of masculine thing. But nowadays things get bent, so, yeah. Gourmand. Gourmand, it means greedy in French. It's calling someone greedy and it refers to food. It is a style of fragrance that's really obvious. It's anything that has a foodie type nature, but not in a savoury way, in a sweet way. So things that are hyper vanillic, things that have accords of things like cupcake, chocolate, anything like that, pastry, patisserie, anything like that, it's a nice obvious one and it's a real popular style of fragrance gourmand because people like to smell like food a lot and, you know, makes you want to just nibble someone's neck. I don't like gourmands, it's not my thing, but that's what a gourmand is. Heart notes. 
I already talked about base notes, so heart notes are the middle part of the pyramid of a fragrance. Normally it's the main character of a fragrance. So if you're looking at a perfume pyramid list and you see top notes, heart notes, base, just know that what's listed in the heart is more often than not the actual main character of the fragrance. They're normally, heart notes are normally flowers, usually sometimes spices, things that are slightly richer and they last a little bit less than base notes. So you have top, which I'll come to, then you have heart, then you have base. So it's the main character and it's what descends into base notes. And heart notes are usually beautiful because they're flowers and things like that. You can have spices in there, you can have resins as heart notes. As I said, I'm gonna keep saying, perfumers move things around all the time nowadays, but that's what heart notes are. Linear. This one might seem obvious as well because linear has its own definition in the rest of the world and in language, but in perfume terms and in the perfumery world, linear refers to a fragrance that doesn't develop over time. It's a fragrance that doesn't have a perfume pyramid. It doesn't have, it doesn't develop from top heart to base. It's something that when you spray it on, it stays along one line. So basically what you get when you spray it is what it's gonna be at the end. Some fragrances are designed to be linear and I like fragrances like that because sometimes you love the way a fragrance smells when you first spray it on and then it changes. So it's nice to sometimes have linear fragrances that just that's what it's going to be, so that's a nice easy one and it, I love linear fragrances if they're really good. Longevity, another really obvious one. All it means is how long the fragrance lasts on your skin. Unfortunately, nowadays, it's a little bit of a struggle to find fragrances that have a great longevity because a lot of things have been reformulated, a lot of materials have been cheapened, a lot of companies are doing cash grabs and longevity is the word is obvious, but in terms of my views on it, I struggle to find things that are super long lasting. But all it means is how long a fragrance lasts on your skin. Musky. This one is a real tricky one. It's not tricky, but I will tell you a story. A lot of customers that come to my shop where I work, I work in a perfume shop, when I ask them what kind of fragrances they're looking for, so many people say musky. And I do feel, and it's no shade, that a lot of people don't really know what they're asking for or what musky actually is. So to explain, musky can go one of two ways. You have the vintage style musks, you have dark animalic musks, things like civet, deer musk, castorium, hyracium. It's that vintage, heavy, kind of dirty kind of musky smell that feels like it's something from an animal. Then you also have much more modern musks that were created in labs around, I think, maybe the 80s and 90s. It's a synthetic type of musk. Things that smell like clean t-shirt, clean skin, laundry. Uh, white musk is a really good example. It's not from an animal, it's a lab-created thing. And so when people say, I want something musky, I, I always try and figure out what it is that they want. So. Musky is both of those things. It can be either dirty animalic skank or it can be clean white t-shirt, modern cleanliness, basically. Musks in the past used to be actual musks from animals. 99% of the time now they're synthetically reproduced, but they can still be dark. But um, white musks have always been lab produced, so I hope that helps you. Notes. This one's a really easy one. It refers back to the music thing. A note in a fragrance is a ingredient. It's something that you can pick out. If you say it has notes of blah blah blah, it's normally an ingredient. Or it can also be an accord. I don't want to try and be too convoluted, but peony, for instance, can be a note in a fragrance, even though it's an accord made up of other things, but it's the main things that you should be able to smell in a fragrance, or it's, it's what perfumers give you as an ingredient list. These are the notes like writing down notes. It's the main things that are in a fragrance. Oriental. Ah, oh, okay, I'm gonna love this one. Oriental is a style of fragrance. It's my personal favorite style of fragrance. What does it mean though when you're talking about it in perfume terms? Oriental fragrances, their style is always something opulent. 
it normally refers to amber. If amber, if the amber accord is in a fragrance, it's, it's normally put in the oriental category. Orientals are rich, opulent, they're usually more sensual, they're norm normally more warm. They contain amber, sometimes spices. You get floral orientals now. You have oriental spices. Some really great examples are Opium by Yves Saint Laurent. To me, that is like the queen of the oriental fragrances. Shalimar by Guerlain is an oriental. To me, they're just exotic. They're, they're rich. They're kind of nighttime dress up and go out fragrances. Just resins and lovely exotic ingredients. And orientals to me are the tippity top of my favorite style of fragrances. Half of my collection is are orientals. <laughs> but yeah, that's what people refer to when it's oriental. Gifts from the Orient. Pillar fragrance. I didn't know about this one until a couple of years ago. I'd only heard it when Terry Mugler released Aura. So what pillar fragrance means is it's basically the opposite of a flanker. A pillar fragrance comes and then flankers come after. So when, for instance, Chanel releases, releases a new fragrance, it can be a new fragrance, but it might be a flanker. It might be a variation of something that exists. But when they announce a new pillar fragrance, it means it's a brand new fragrance. It's not a variation or a copy or a, a well, let's say a watered down version of things that already exist with a couple of notes tweaked. So when Chanel released Gabrielle, it was a brand new fragrance to the brand. When Dior released Joy, it was a brand new fragrance. When Mugler released Aura, brand new fragrance. You get the gist. Projection, this one might seem obvious as well, but it does get confused with sillage, which I'll come to in a minute. Projection is basically a fragrance's ability to jump off of your skin. The best way to describe it is if I'm standing in one corner of a room and you're standing in the other, if I spray a fragrance here, can you smell it on that side of the room without any of us moving? If you spray a fragrance on your wrist and you're holding it, how close does it need to be to your nose for you to smell it? Can this thing jump off of your skin really far or is it a skin scent? I should have added that one in. Skin scent, something that stays very close, something you have to huff your wrist to smell. So projection just means how far can it jump off of my skin? Done. Pyramid, I've talked about this one a little bit previous. Pyramid is the structure of a perfume, meaning top notes, heart notes, base notes. It's called a pyramid because base notes is half of the fragrance. Heart notes is some kind of percentage, but it's less, and then top notes is even less, so it looks like a pyramid when you see it on paper. Given, a lot of perfumes now have abandoned that. Modern perfumery doesn't always have a pyramid as its structure. Some of them have a circle where different notes will reveal themselves at different times. Some of them have push and pull technology. It's all changed, but most fragrances have a pyramid. Sillage. This one is the one that got me so bad. I've heard people say silage, I've heard people say silage, I've even heard people say spillage. Mm -hmm. Sillage is one that really gets confused with projection. Sillage means a fragrance's ability to hang in the air long after you've left. The best way to describe it is, have you ever gotten in a lift before? and you're the only person in it, but you can smell someone else's perfume that was there five, 10, 20 minutes before you. It's a fragrance's ability to stay in the atmosphere long after you've left. It's more about the trail that it leaves behind you. So if you've ever walked behind somebody on the street on a non-windy day, and you can smell their perfume trailing behind, that's what sillage is. I think it's a beautiful word and I love what it actually is. Some fragrances have amazing sillage and some have zero. It's all fun discovering which ones do and which ones don't for me. Soliflor. Soliflor is one that I learned when I did my course. Soliflor means singular floral. So it's a fragrance that focuses on a single flower. They do it in a couple of different ways, perfumers. So they can either put the same flower in such quantities that it's in the opening, in the heart, and it's in the dry down. They can also do it by building up a singular flower from many varieties. So if you were building a rose solid floor, for instance, you might put damask rose, um, centerfolia rose, and Bulgarian rose together to create this entire 
bouquet of one flower that focuses on that one thing and stays like that for the entire time that you wear it. So that's what a solid floor is. Apparently they are some of the most difficult fragrances to make and it's, it's kind of like a testament to a perfumer's ability when they can create a solid floor that lasts and has the same flower running through the entire wear length. It's a cool one, I like that one. Top notes, I'm not sure I need to go into it, but we've talked about base and heart. Top notes are the opening act of the show. It's kind of like the comedian that you watch before, or it's like the support act of a concert before you, before you watch the actual singer that you've gone to see. They are kind of like a highlight of the fragrance. They're normally the, the first, well they are the first things that you smell. They're normally citruses. Sometimes they can be aqueous florals, they can be aquatic kind of notes. It's always interchangeable. I'm just talking from experience. It's normally a citrusy thing. Citruses descend into flowers and then descend into woods as a general rule. Very, very general. I've said millions of times. It's always bended, but top notes are the fleeting notes. They're the things that burn off of your skin the quickest so you can get to the heart, the character of your fragrance. And that's it. I hope you liked my little A to, well, I'll say A to T rundown of perfume jargon. Just language that gets thrown around by everyone in the industry and kind of, as a newbie, I experienced myself, you know, having head scratching moments thinking, what does that mean? Google. But um, yeah, I hope it was helpful. I hope you guys liked the video. I'm out from my know. Click my logo down there to subscribe. I'm trying to make the world smell better one video at a time. Goodbye.